the Azerbaijani government has issued a statement saying that Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh can stay if they want to. But many ethnic Armenians have chosen to flee, with more than half of the population of the enclave now on the move. No going back. These refugees fled their homes in Nagorno-Karabakh to Armenia, bringing with them only what they could carry. Their homeland, as they know it, is collapsing. The separatist government says it will dissolve itself by the end of the year and cede control to Azerbaijan. It's painful. What should I think? We were born and raised in Nagorno-Karabakh. Now it's just nothing and dust. The lives we had have been erased. A Karabakhi Armenian cannot live under the yoke of Azerbaijan. Mother Armenia used to defend us. We felt safe and lived there as Armenians. The Azerbaijani government was quick to release a statement, promising to ease the integration of ethnic Armenians living in Nagorno-Karabakh into the Republic of Azerbaijan. But after decades of a bitter struggle between Armenia and Azerbaijan over their territory, Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh have little faith. Armenia's prime minister accused Azerbaijan of ethnic cleansing, something which Azerbaijan refutes. The exodus of Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh as a result of Azerbaijan's ethnic cleansing policy continues. Analysis of the situation shows that in the coming days there will be no Armenians left in Nagorno-Karabakh. This is an act of ethnic cleansing. More than half of Nagorno-Karabakh's Armenian population has fled the territory, knowing that it is very unlikely that they will ever be able to return home. Well, I'm joined now by Esmira Jarafova. She's with the Centre of analysis of international relations in Azerbaijan. Now, that is a think tank that's aligned with Azerbaijan's government. She joins me tonight from Baku. It's good to have you with us this evening. Azerbaijan says that ethnic Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh have nothing to fear, that they can stay. Why then have we seen them leaving by the tens of thousands? First of all, good evening and thanks for having me. And as, as you rightly pointed, Azerbaijani authorities declared uh, that uh, these people living in Karabakh are our citizens. And we have tried our best as Azerbaijani side to meet their demands, to meet their needs in terms of humanitarian assistance, in terms of extending them the medical assistance and extending all sorts of assistance that they need. And also, uh, when Azerbaijan conducted the short uh, anti-terror operation, it was very precise. It was very uh, uh, directed only to in leg legitimate military targets. So no civilians actually were hurt, hurt during these operations. And we also heard from what? the words of uh, Armenia's Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan, who said on 21st of September that there were no casualties among civilians. So this hysteria and this, uh, let's say, uh, massive uh, leaving of people uh, from Karabakh has nothing to do with Azerbaijan's policies. It's their free choice, first of all. And also some well, of them acknowledge that... Jafarova, if I, if I some could... Of them acknowledge that they are living, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, you said that there have been no casualties um, in that military attack last week. Um, how, where, what's your source on that? We, of course, as journalists, yeah, we can't refer, get into I the country. I just refer to Armenia's prime minister. That's mm -hmm. the primary source that anyone could get. The country's prime minister said uh, that on 21st of September, uh, by when he was appealing to the nation, that there were no losses among the casual, no casualties, no losses among the civilians. I mean, yes. that's the official reference point that I was making. So uh, there well, was no whatsoever though? intent on the part of Azerbaijan's Azerbaijan to harm, harm any civilians. Therefore, we provided all the needs 
uh, that they actually needed, all the assistance that they needed. And as Abacha also declared, that not only the civilians, civilians are not our target, they've never been our target. However, even those militias and separatists that fought against Azerbaijan that were illegally deployed in Karabakh, even mm -hmm. they have given have been given free passage to Armenia and separatists, if they return to their barracks, they will also be granted amnesty. <clears throat> That's well, what I, Azerbaijani government said. I want to, I, yeah. I, I, I'd like to believe you, but my, my point is we as journalists, we it's uh, it's impossible for us to get into Nagorno-Karabakh to verify these things. And there have been requests for Azerbaijan to let international observers into the enclave to see exactly what is going on and Azerbaijan has said that is not going to happen. Why? Well, you know, um, uh, there are international journalists uh, covering the stories, and uh, we have heard some of uh, the refugees who have been passing Lutch and Rod acknowledge the fact to agents France Press that they are being pushed and they are leaving at the ends of the separatists. So there are journalists on the place. Probably you have to look for their legal procedures of how to uh, make these uh, things happen. <clears throat> so it's not that we're not letting, letting anyone there. The only concern we might be having is a security concern. So they might Mm -hmm. be some procedures to be filled in order to, uh, let's say, fulfill all the necessities, all the obligations, all the let's say, requirements of security, because, I mean, security-wise, we have to provide the security of those people that are yeah. coming to those territories. No, but otherwise, that's true. Uh, there is an international coverage. The, the European Federation of Journalists, I just wanted to, you know, to make, make it clear, has said that in Azerbaijan, journalists have to request special uh, authorizations from the presidential administration to travel to Karabakh, and they say that those authorizations are rarely granted. Because, be because it's not safe. First of all, there is a huge landmine contamination, and if, if we bring in people there to the areas that are not landmine free, and how can we, uh, let's say, provide their security? Remember, Azerbaijani lands, liberated Azerbaijani lands, is the, one of the most contaminated with landmines in the world. We will need mm -hmm. 25 billion US dollars in 30 years to clean those territories. And millions of Azerbaijanis that were expelled during the first Karabakh war, they cannot go back only because there is a huge landmine issue, only because their homes are gone. So, of course, security is a thing. So that's why these things are not so easy. Let me get your take on the, the wider geopolitical um, situation that we're in. Um, Armenia has accused Russia of being distracted by the war in Ukraine and, and not um, living up to its security commitments to Armenia. Ha if there had been no war in Ukraine, if there had been no energy crisis and demand for new sources of energy, would Azerbaijan be standing as strong this evening? Well, yeah, this is a very hypothetical question. And honestly, if you're looking for a yes or no question, I can't give you this yes or no question. But I can only tell you that Azerbaijani territories have been occupied for 30 years. There are four United Nations Security Council resolutions of 1993, which were calling for immediate unconditional withdrawal of all Armenian forces from Azerbaijani territories. Those resolutions were ignored for three decades, and nobody actually cared about their making sure about their fulfillment. So what Azerbaijan did actually, after giving warnings for a long time, after putting up with the mediator's work that mm -hmm. were unsuccessful on the part of the OSC Minsk group, Azerbaijan embarked on, uh, let's say, liberation of its land. Also, uh, after, in the consequence, in the aftermath of the repeated provocations, repeated attacks on the part of Armenia against our territories, against our sovereignty, against our borders, against our people. So if you have been following this story, uh, mm -hmm. like for the 44 day war, when it ha happened, how it happened, you could read and see that there were repeated provocations and attacks on the part of Armenian government, specifically on the part of Nikol Pashinyan against mm -hmm. Azerbaijan, uh, repeated border provocations when Azerbaijan finally on the 27th of September, decided to embark on this counter-terrorist, counter-offensive uh, counter operation and liberate its land. And this time, this short counter-terrorist operation happened because Armenia was still creating problems. After liberating of these territories, they were still inf infiltrating to our territories. They were still bringing in landmines. They brought in landmines and planted them on the newly constructed road. And our policemen, six, six people and uh, six uh, military people and two civilians actually died as a result of the landmine explosion, which were planted there newly after the liberation of the land. So Ms. it was actually a red light for Azerbaijan. Ms. Ms. Jeff, let me just ask you before we run out of time, the role of the European Union um, and, and Germany, you know, they, they have tried to, to act somewhat as a, a peace 
broker or mediator in this crisis. Um, there were talks held earlier this week in Brussels, but many in Brussels, particularly here in Germany, are saying that the European Union looks weak. The United States looks weak. Um, these big powers look weak in dealing with this situation. Um, do you see it as the picture that, as being the same? Well, you know, I, I, I do not uh, want to, again, uh, speculate about these issues. But what I can say that European Union was a really and is still a really valuable party partner in terms of achieving post-conflict normalization and fostering a peace agenda between Armenia and Azerbaijan. And uh, all the results and positive results that were achieved um, on the Armenia-Azerbaijani peace track was actually mediated um, by the European Union, um, um, facilitation by the European Union. So we actually value uh, highly the role of the European Union in Armenia-Azerbaijan normalization. And we think that the only problem created in this situation mm -hmm. was coming from Armenia. Because Armenia did not want to abide by its commitment of, of the November 2020 agreement. Mm -hmm. Neither it wanted to abide by the agreement that were reached by the mediation of the European Union. So we, what we witness is after some uh, results and progress achieved specifically after the 15th July uh, meeting in Brussels, where mm -hmm. both Armenia and Azerbaijan finally recognized each other's territorial integrity in terms of figures, figuratively, yes. 29 8 for Armenia, 86 for 8 for Azerbaijan, which means Armenia in, uh, it recognized Azerbaijan's territorial integrity, okay. including Karabakh. Um, then Ar Armenian uh, Prime Minister sent a letter of congratulation to the separatists of Karabakh on the occasion of their independence. This and they then they start to build up uh, military around the borders of Azerbaijan. So Armenia actually torpedoes the process. Ms. Ms. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but you, ha you have certainly um, done a good job in, in making your point clear, and we appreciate that. It's Mira Jafarova with yes, the Center of Pardon. Analysis of International Relations in Azerbaijan. Thank you. Thank you and good night. And more on this from Olesia Vartanian from the International Crisis Group. She's a senior researcher on the South Caucasus region and she joins us from the Armenian capital, Yerevan. Uh, now, this formal decree by the separatist government in Nagorno-Karabakh is that the end of the dream for independence. Well, this is definitely the end to this chapter that started in the beginning of the 90s when the local officials, they declared independence. Uh, then there were two wars, um, many escalation, many incidents. And then certainly this is also the consequence of this military operation that lasted for only several hours, but brought the end to this de facto entity. Does it mean that the conflict is over? I'm not sure, because we have thousands of uh, ethnic Armenians from nagorno Karabakh fleeing, but still thinking that this is their homeland. That probably means that the conflict is not over, and then we are certainly to see more developments happening and taking place in the coming years. So you don't think that it means that Armenia is finally giving up on Nagorno-Karabakh? It is not about Armenia. I'm talking about those who are living in Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Armenians have been living in, in this uh, very region uh, for many centuries. There are some very important um, objects of cultural heritage. And now these are the people who believe that this is their homeland. I was talking about them. Armenia has its own challenges with Azerbaijan at this very moment. Its border with, uh, with, with neighbors is not uh, uh, demarcated. Uh, there are some Azerbaijani troops stationed deep inside Armenia. There is also this claim for having so-called corridor um, in one of the one of the regions of Armenia. So Armenia has plenty to to uh, to resolve uh, on its own, mm. Azerbaijan, at this very moment. So what have you heard then about those ethnic Armenians who still yeah, are in Nagorno-Karabakh and want to remain there? They are packing to leave. So this is kind of the main goal. I haven't spoken to a single person who uh, who plans to stay there on the ground. Maybe there will be uh, some very few people who decide to do that. At, at this very moment, the main concern and uh, of the locals is uh, to pack and also to find some petrol to uh, to get a car and to pack and leave. You know that there is a huge line uh, of people who are 
you know, taken with road between Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia. And unfortunately, it takes many, many hours. There were already people suffering with no water and no food. Um, it will take still several days for with uh, people to get out. So what kind of future lies ahead for those people that are, have fled their homes? These people will live now in Armenia, the majority of them. Uh, the local government will have to find resources and then will have to adopt its policies in order to integrate them as much as it, it can. Uh, Armenians from Nagorno-Karabakh, they are different from Armenians who live in Armenia. They speak a distinct language. They have their own traditions. So it will be not really very easy to integrate them. This will be a challenge that uh, Armenia will have to face for years to come. Thank you very much, Alessia Bartanian from the International Crisis Group in Armenia. Thank you.